Hi everyone, my name is Sahil. I'm an MCAT tutor here at Shamasi and Academic Consulting. Today we'll be going over a psych search passage and I'll discuss some of the strategies you can use when encountering questions like these on the MCAT. Alrighty, so we got the passage pulled up here in front of me. Basically gonna just read it out loud, think out loud so you know exactly what's going on in my head. Um, I'm going to be using the outlining strategy. Uh, this is one I use a lot just because it helps me keep myself focused and just engage with the text. So basically after every paragraph, just going to write a short little summary of what I had just read. Um, also going to discuss a method for analyzing figures as well. Um, and as a heads up, for test day, you want to be going at around a pace of eight minutes per passage um, for this section of the exam. However, since I'm going to be walking through this section, um, I'll be going a little bit slower than that. So for your own independent practice and for test day as well, make sure you're shooting for around eight minutes per passage. All right, so with that all out of the way, let's go ahead and dive right into this. Task relevance, motivation, and reward expectancy are well-known factors that influence the filtering of information into working memory. When visual items are presented sequentially, the accuracy to which an item is remembered not only depends on its position within the sequence, but also on task relevance and reward expectancy. All right, so a lot of things I'm seeing here uh, tie back in with stuff that I reviewed during my content review um, phase of my prep. So. You know, all these things about task relevance, for example, motivation, reward, expectancy, all of that really sticks out to me um, with things from memory and uh, motivation. So if I was highlighting, I might highlight some of those things, but since I'm going more of the outlining route, I think I will summarize this paragraph as saying, um, factors influencing, and they talked about our working memory here. So right here, as they had mentioned, that these were some of the factors that influence working memory. So my handwriting might be a little bit sloppy here. Um, so for test day, you know, if your handwriting is a little illegible at times, that might be a concern if you're not able to read it. But, you know, if you have spelling errors or using some shorthand or, um, you know, you're scribbling because you got to go fast, as long as you can read it, um, that should suffice. Uh, so don't stress out about having like the perfect um, outline where then you're kind of erasing things or um, rewriting the summary so it looks prettier. Um, time is of the essence. So don't get too caught up on those little things. Remember this strategy is so we can be efficient and maintain our focus. So with the first paragraph out of the way, let's go ahead and move on to our second paragraph. Researchers are interested in comparing differences and performance that might result when cues toward reward expectancy are presented during three different stages, memory encoding, maintenance, retrieval. In a study, participants performed a task in which they were presented with three visual targets for three seconds during a sample phase, followed by a two second maintenance phase, and then they were asked to reproduce the orientation of one of the targets. All right, so they've set us up uh, with this experiment here MCAT loves to test you on your ability to reason through experiments and experimental design. So we really want to make sure we're staying focused here. Um, to summarize this paragraph, I'm just going to talk about what the study, kind of the setup was, or what like they were looking at. So for this study, they're looking at change in performance from um, reward expectancy. Reward expect. I'm gonna again shorthand this a little bit um, just because I'll know this means reward expectancy and um, also because I don't really have too much space in here. On test day, you'll have a little um, laminated uh, type of little notebook, so there'll be a lot more space for you to write, but I'm kind of squeezing it in and be here in between um, paragraphs where there's some white space. So on test day, this shouldn't really be a problem for you. Alrighty, so now with this paragraph here summarized, let's go ahead and move on to paragraph three. Each of these three targets were associated with cues indicating payout awards of varying amounts, which the participant could expect to receive if they successfully recreated the target. Four conditions were tested, one in which no cues to reward were presented at all, or three others in which cues were presented during, a, during the sample, memory, or response phase of the task. The error rate of participant recreated figures is presented in figure one. All right, so 
for this par- paragraph, they're just expanding on the study um, and what like the different conditions are for our participants here. So I would summarize that. Uh, I would write P3, they had uh, reward queues. So you could either be in the one that, in the condition where there was none, um, the sample, memory, or response. All right, so now with the paragraph uh, summarized, let's take a look at figure one. Um, There's a method I really like using when I see figures when I'm reading a paragraph, or a passage I mean, and that's the Tade P method. So when you see a graph or any sort of figure on the MCAT uh, in a passage, it can be, um, you can be a little uncertain, like how deep should I go into this? Because you don't wanna go dive, you don't wanna dive too deep into it because then um, it might happen that none of the questions really even need you to refer back to it. So that could be just kind of an unnecessary time sink. Um, But also you might wanna still look at it because it's experimental data here. So that could help you better understand what the passage is discussing. So you don't wanna just skip it entirely and just wait for a question to be, telling you to refer back to it. Um, So I like using this Tade P method because it gives you a more of a high yield overview of a figure before, um, so you don't really dive too deep into it, but you still get kind of the basic stuff out of it to help you understand the passage better. So Tade P stands for title, axes, independent variable, dependent variable, and pattern. So here we have our title, right? Results of the working memory task in which cues were presented during the sample phase, maintenance phase, response phase, or not at all. Our axes, we can see we have potential reward and we also have the error here, or we have uh, performance being measured as well. Um, With this being presumably retrieval time. um, So that's gonna be here with our potential reward, the condition, the, um, the participants were in. Um, being your independent variable, because that's the variable we are um, manipulating. So your independent variable is the one that's being manipulated, and your dependent variable, you can think of it as the one that kind of responds to this change. So here, potential reward, you know, the condition that the participants are in is gonna be your independent variable, and then like the error um, or the performance here is gonna be our dependent variable. Lastly, P, this stands for uh, performance, or sorry, <laughs> P stands for pattern, I mean. Pattern meaning, can you just off this quick glance uh, identify a um, you know trend that's kind of a little obvious. So just looking at it, I do notice one trend here in uh, figure 1B, where it seems like in this sample phase, uh, higher reward will, seems to lead to a decrease in the error that occurs in recall. So there was no reward here compared to then there was a reward here and then even more reward. Seems like there's a little downward trend as we up our reward. All right, so with that high level overview um, achieved you know, with the Tate P method, go ahead and just move on. Um, I felt like from what I had just read or using the Tate P method here, I've got a good understanding now of the figure to the point where um, I've got a a good idea of what the passage is discussing here, what the data is probably indicating to us, Um, but I haven't dived too deep into it where I'm feeling like I might be um, wasting some time here. So we'll still be efficient with our time here. Um, We'll come back if we need to, um, if a question asks us to refer back to it. Um, So with that, let's go ahead and move on to our fourth paragraph. In a follow-up experiment, researchers completed the same experiment but reduced the sample phase duration to 300 milliseconds. Cues to reward were either presented during the sample phase or not at all. The results are presented here in figure two. All right, so to summarize this paragraph, it seems like what's happened is that they're just doing another study and it's basically the same as the previous one, but they're just changing one thing where in the sample phase, there's this um, decrease by 300 milliseconds. So just to summarize, I would write study two, and then I would put sample decrease 300 milliseconds. 
All right, and let's use that same Tade P method to analyze figure two. So Tade P here, our title is gonna be right here, right? Results of the working memory task in which cues were presented during the sample phase or not at all. For our axes, we have potential reward. Um, also, we have the, the degree of error. Um, also looking here, it looks like measuring performance again, um, but maybe with retrieval time. And then for independent variables, this is very similar to figure one here. So our potential reward and basically what we were measuring here for a dependent variable would be the error or the performance. And then finally, if there was a pattern. Don't really see a pattern here. Um, that duration to 300 milliseconds seems like that um, might have caused there to not be much of a disparity like we saw in figure 1b. Um, so here though in figure uh, 2a, you know, we do see a little bit of a pattern. Seems like with higher reward, retrieval time seems to be improved. So I like that as my little high yield overview of the figure. So let's go ahead and now move on to our final paragraph. Researchers concluded that the influence of variations within the visual stimuli on memory accuracy depended strongly on the duration of time they were presented for. Alrighty, so that's just one sentence and it might be hard to summarize just one sentence into, uh, you, you know, into your own words here. Um, so what I often like to think of this um, outline as is a um, table of contents almost for a passage so that you can use it as a way to navigate a passage. So if you have questions um, that you're reading over and one of them directs you to refer back to the passage, instead of having to dig through the entire passage, you can use your table of contents as a way to approximate where the information you need will probably be. So giving this kind of like a paragraph heading here is what I'm kind of suggesting here. So instead of basically rewriting the sentence, just give it like what would be the paragraph heading. So I would say this is basically saying your study conclusion. Alrighty, so now with the outline out of the way, we've read the passage, we've taken a look at our figures. Let's go ahead and dive into our questions. So our first question here states, after the conclusion of the study, participants were more likely to successfully recall the last visual stimulus they were asked to recreate than the first. This is a result of the primacy effect, hippocampus degeneration, recency effect, or memory extinction. So the key thing they mention is that the participants were more likely to remember um, the last visual stimulus than the first. So the primacy effect is basically the opposite of that, where um, you're more likely to remember things or information that appears in the beginning of some sequence than that which appears later on in that sequence. So A doesn't really work out here because again, it's basically the opposite. Hippocampus generation, um, in a way I could see um, the hippocampus, you know, it's really involved with memory. So it could definitely cause some issues with memory where they're not able to remember the first thing they had, um, the first stimulus. But this general pattern that's being observed isn't going to be what hippocampus generation would lead to. Hippocampus generation would probably lead to all around um, diminishment in memory and recall. So I highly doubt that this is going to be the best answer here. I can in some ways come up with some assumptions and justify it, but um, really don't feel like this is going to be the best answer. So we'll hold on that. Let's check out C and D. If those aren't any better, then maybe it'll be B. Um, but let's check out those two first. So C, the recency effect. Now this is pretty much um, now the opposite of the primacy effect. So the recency effect states that um, information presented towards the end of a sequence is more likely to be recalled than information presented earlier on in that sequence. And that's basically what the question stem is saying, that the participants were more likely to remember the last visual stimulus than the first. So this question stem is essentially a textbook example of the recency effect. So now I'm really thinking it's probably C and we can eliminate B now. But let's check out D just to make sure that that's not a better answer. So memory extinction, again, similar to my justification or what I said about B where sure it's possible that memory extinction is happening where they're forgetting just the first stimulus they were um, exposed to. But the fact that they're specifically talking about this pattern here of remembering the last stimulus but not the first, that's still more in line with C, the recency effect. So C is still going to be our best answer here. 
Alrighty, so let's go ahead and move on to our next question. Which of the following best explains the differences in the performance between trials when a low reward queue was presented during the sample phase and trials in which a high reward queue was presented during the sample phase? Alrighty, so they're talking about um, during the, specifically the sample phase, right? What explains the difference between a lower reward queue, such as this here, and then maybe a higher reward queue, because we do have this difference here, right? So A, interference effect, B, spreading activation, C, positive reinforcement, and D, negative reinforcement. All right, so A, interference effect. The interference effect basically tells us that our attention to external information, uh, such as a reward, um, can affect your recall. So already, I like this answer a lot, um, but like I said with the previous question, let's make sure the other answer choices aren't any better. So we'll hold on A, but really thinking this is probably our right answer. B, spreading activation. This is when um, you're able to recall similar concepts because they're related to each other. Um, maybe, you know, like for example, think of it almost actually like as a web that can, um, like a little web of uh, related concepts. So let's say there was um, the color red and then I'm more likely to remember that I saw a fire truck on my drive to work yesterday. Um, that's not really what is going on here. There wasn't anything about like similar concepts or this again at the end of the day the reward thing is what's key and that's not really what's going on with spreading activation so don't like b still think a is the best answer c and d are both um you know related to um conditioning and so i don't really think positive reinforcement negative reinforcement are the best answer here because again those are more so related to conditioning and a seems like that's going to be just the one that's more in line with this idea of there being these changes in a reward queue. And so with the interference effect that there's this, uh, the participants see that there's this change in, or that the reward queue is um, higher or that there is no reward queue or the reward queue is low, um, that's gonna potentially uh, affect their recall. And so that goes hand in hand with the interference effect. Positive negative reinforcement, again, more so do with conditioning so I'd eliminate C and D and go with A all right let's go ahead and move on to our next question participants appear to have improved performance at various trials due to all right so they mentioned increased opportunity to encode episodic memory higher recall percent due to implicit memory decreased capacity for echoic memory and encoding of iconic memory so the key thing is to know what each of these things are so episodic memory is gonna be uh, experiences. So this would be um, you remembering your, let's say, your 14th or 15th birthday party, right? Um, implicit memory, this is going to be more so with uh, procedural things. So for example, it might be how to drive a car, um, you know, how to ride a bike, for example. So more procedural goes with implicit memory. Echoic memory, that is auditory. So things you hear, and then iconic memory is visual memory. So they mentioned to us that in this um, study, let's go back to paragraph two, because I recall they said, participants performed a task in which they were presented with three visual targets for three seconds. Okay, so when, I, when we see visual targets, it seems like most likely our answer is gonna be D. So we can go ahead and eliminate some of these answer choices like C, for example, because this doesn't have to do with auditory, and we can eliminate B because it's have to do with procedural. However, I would caution you to pick D and uh, suggest you read a little bit more closely. After this three visual targets, they mentioned that it's for three seconds. So this is a very tricky question because it requires you to not only know that iconic memory is related to visual, but also that iconic memory is only held for about under a second. So when we have this here, these three visual targets for three seconds, iconic memory is not gonna be what's at play here. And instead, it's gonna be our episodic memory that comes in. So really tricky here. You had to have known kind of a, um, this little tricky detail that the iconic memory is not just that it's visual, but also it's held for under a second. And so we can eliminate D and A 
um, becomes our best answer. So uh, we can also just look at figure one again, that basically the errors went down when the reward queues um, were going up. Uh, so that could affect their episodic memory, this experience that they were having. Again, main reason why um, I would eliminate B and C is because those are procedural and auditory, and then D can be eliminated because even though it's referring to visual, it's held for less than one second, making A our best answer. All right, let's go ahead and move on to our next question. During the study, participants are most likely engaging in free recall, chunking, retroactive interference. All right, so let's break down what each of these things are. Free recall is basically unprompted re re retrieval. So unprompted memory recall would be like, um, they're not given any cues, they're not given any hints, they just have to freely recall these things. So just exactly like what it sounds. So we'll write this here as a note, unprompted retrieval. Chunking is a strategy where you basically group things together as a way to memorize them. And that's not exactly what was going on here. So I would eliminate two. Free recall, yes, they were not given any hints um, when having to recreate um, these figures or whatever they were, these visual targets that they were shown. So free recall, I'm really liking a lot. and. Um, so that means we can eliminate B because we also eliminated this here, that two only. But also since we've already eliminated two, we can go ahead and eliminate C and D and we could just go with A right now. But let's look at Roman numeral three just to make sure that's not a better answer choice or that isn't a valid answer as well. So retroactive interference. This is when you have, let's say there's some old information you know and now there's some new information new information pardon my handwriting here let's try to write that a little bit better here new info and what happens is this new information will block the retrieval of old information so an example of this would be if you're um, living in one area or in one address and then you move to a new area or you move to a new address and after some time, it becomes hard to recall what your old address was. That could be because this new address, um, this new information is blocking the retrieval of that old information. And again, that's not really what was going on here. Nothing indicates that there was some issues with some new information they had acquired presenting, preventing them from recalling this old information. So we can eliminate three, and that leaves us with A, one only, as our best answer. All right, let's move on to the next question. Before the experiment, one participant reports that she has participated in a similar study before. However, she is unable to recall the context of the prior experiment. This is a result of A, memory decline, B, priming, C, Q, recall, or D, source amnesia. So basically just gotta know what each of these terms are, right? So memory decline, this could potentially play a role um, where you basically, but it usually occurs more so in late adulthood where you'll have like this decrease in your short term memory in late adulthood. And similar to what we were discussing in the first question here, where we had like hippocampus generation and memory extinction, in a way, potentially this is due to memory decline but it doesn't feel like this would be our best answer choice. So instead, um, I will hold off on selecting this just now or even eliminating it and just make sure there isn't any better answer choices. If there is, isn't, then maybe it is A, but let's see if what the answer, other answer choices have, um, if they're any uh, more correct than this first one. So B, priming. Priming is, um, when you have exposure to one stimulus and then that affects your um, perception of the next or subsequent stimulus. So from the question stem, that's not really what's being asked here. We're being told this scenario where this participant, she feels like she's been in a similar study, but she just can't remember the context of that study. Um, that doesn't affect, that doesn't really have to do with priming and the definition I just said for priming. So I can eliminate B. A seems like still a better answer, so let's go on to C, Q to recall. Basically the opposite of free recall, which we discussed here, where this is now prompted memory retrieval. Um, 
again, not really related to what the question stem is presenting us with. So A might be a better answer here still, so I'd eliminate C. D, source amnesia. Now, I really like this answer choice because source amnesia is the inability to recall um, the source of some information or some memory or some experience. It's also commonly referred to as source monitoring errors. So an example of this would be, um, let's say a patient um, is speaking to their physician and they said, oh, I've heard some great things about this drug. Um, my friend, uh, she, she has told me how it's been uh, very helpful for her in her life. Um, but it turns out that all the great things she had heard about the drug weren't actually from her friends. It was actually from, let's say, an ad for the drug. So she's not remembering the context or the source from which she got the information she has. And that's basically what's going on here, where this participant recalls being in a similar study so she's recalling some information but she's not remembering the exact context of that experiment and so this is a much better answer to choice than a so we can eliminate a and lock in d as our best answer all right last question the working memory model implies that the visual spatial sketchpad prevents sensory information from entering working memory the central executive uses reward information to prioritize sensory information the phonological loop allows participants to reproduce targets. The episodic buffer uses context cues to prevent memory interference. All right, so the key thing is knowing the working memory model and what each of these things does. So our visual spatial sketch pad here, this is gonna be responsible for storing visual and just like it sounds, visual spatial it stores visual and spatial information in our short-term memory. So visual, and spatial info and short-term memory. So not really uh, accurate um, description of this in answer choice A, so I would eliminate it. B, the central executive uses reward information to prioritize sensory information. This works really well. The central executive is involved with um, your attention and allocating um, where your focus is. So. It definitely can take uh, reward information um, to dictate uh, where we want to put our focus, right? So I like B a lot, but let's go ahead and look at C and D as well. The phonological loop. So this is going to be responsible for taking um, verbal, written, or just language-based information and putting that into your short-term memory. So again, this isn't an accurate characterization of what this um, what the phonological loop does. So we can eliminate C. Again, this is um, language language um, information. All right, so C has been eliminated. Let's go on to D. The episodic buffer uses context cues to prevent memory interference. So episodic buffer, this is basically gonna just take some information that's in the working memory, integrate it, and then um, send it to the long-term memory or store it in your long-term memory. So again, this isn't really accurate of what the episodic buffer does. So we can go ahead and eliminate that one as well, making B our best answer here. Alrighty, well, that's going to wrap things up for us today. Uh, if you found this video helpful, please give it a like. Um, also subscribe to stay up to date with all our content. And also check out the link in the description below where you can sign up for a free MCAT question of the day. Basically every single day a MCAT question will be sent directly to your inbox. Great way to start your morning and get you ready to study for the day. So. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.